Last week, we explored the life of Yukio Mishima, one of the most prominent Japanese writers of the last 100 years. Today, we'll be exploring one of the later efforts of Nagisa Oshima, a name synonymous with the Japanese New Wave. This movement, which we've made reference to multiple times now, was one initiated by Shochiku when, in 1959, they allowed several assistant directors to assume directorial positions without the previously required years of working as assistant directors. David Desser, in his seminal work on the phenomenon Eros Plus Massacre, explains that several directors working in the 1950s foretold the rise of the new wave, but that Nagisa Oshima himself was the first true new wave director, beginning his lengthy career with the first true new wave film, Town of Love and Hope. The Japanese New Wave, over the course of the following decade, became the artistic embodiment of the political and social unrest occurring throughout the country. Oshima, having been a politically active student in university, was an ideal figurehead for this movement, along with the likes of other directors like Koji Wakamatsu, Shohei Imamura, and Shinsuke Ogawa. The New Wave is said to have petered out more or less by the mid-70s, as political tensions laxed. But directors like Oshima and Wakamatsu never let go of their political slant. Thus, ten years later, we arrive in 1982 with today's film, Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence. This film was something of an anomaly for Oshima, especially with respect to his earlier works. As his career moved onward and his production rate slowed, Oshima began to make more traditionally structured films with potentially wider appeal than his experimental, politically driven films of the 1960s. Namely, this involved Merry Christmas Mr. Lawrence being a British-Japanese joint production starring prominent composer Ryuichi Sakamoto and comedian Beat Takeshi, alongside Scottish star Tom Conti and, well, David Bowie. Sakamoto had no other acting roles to his name, while Kitano was known almost exclusively as a comedian at this point. Today, we might know of him as a major director whose gritty Yakuza efforts have cemented him as an all-around badass. In the 80s, though, it would have been questionable how well Takeshi could have even pulled off such a dramatic role. Oshima took this gamble on him as a serious actor, after seeing him play a serial rapist in Okubo Kiyoshi no Hanzai, or The Crime of Kiyoshi Okubo and a cult leader who abducts women in Iesu no Hakobune, or The Ark of Jesus. Initially, this gamble did not pay off, with the initial Japanese screenings of today's film resulting in riotous laughter on the part of the audience at seeing the comedic Kitano portraying a sadistic guard. Once international opinion came to recognize the merit of Merry Christmas Mr. Lawrence, however, the opinions of local critics were tempered, and they began to take Kitano more seriously. This wouldn't be the first time international opinion would affect Kitano's career, but that's a story for another day. These television roles, as well as Kitano's role in Merry Christmas Mr. Lawrence, went against his comedic persona, but without them, and without Oshima's willingness to gamble on the young actor, Kitano's career may have led him down a different path indeed. On the British side of things, uh... Scottish, in the first guy's case, we have Tom Conti, an actor who has been working in the UK since the late 50s, and who Americans will likely recognize from The Dark Knight Rises. And then there's David Bowie. Need we say more? No, but seriously, if you don't know David Bowie, he was one of the most influential pop musicians of the past 50 years, who also had a fairly consistent career in acting. Maybe names like Ziggy Stardust, Labyrinth, or The Prestige will help call him to mind. Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence is all about the daily life of a Japanese POW camp run by the Imperial Japanese Army, and containing many allied prisoners. Lawrence, played by Conti, is a British prisoner fluent in Japanese, who works more or less as an unofficial translator between the allied soldiers and the guards. Sakamoto plays Captain Yanoi, the man officially in charge of the camp, while Kitano plays Hara, the Gunso, something like a drill sergeant of the camp. Bowie, meanwhile, is a recent arrival known as Jack Selliers, whose presence serves as the inciting action for the main plot. There are a number of aspects we can examine with this film and the reality or fiction contained within, but there's one sort of big elephant in the room that we ought to clear up first. As always, we recommend that you check out the film before we delve further, but we won't be spoiling any of the major plot points. We feel that this video in particular is especially important, so please feel free to keep watching without fear of spoilers. Anyway, on to that elephant. 
One of the main characters, Ryuichi Sakamoto's Captain Yanoi, is the reason that I discovered this film in the first place years ago. He's a very heavily coded gay character who has some, shall we say, interesting scenes with Bowie's celliers. Again, this isn't a spoiler because it's more or less one of the film's main themes. While one might argue that the homosexuality seen in Yonoi and Celliers is an expression of the masculinity present in imperial military culture, in truth, we think that this serves another purpose. There's a very specific reason that today's video is directly following our previous video. Understand that viewing our episode on Yukio Mishima's short film Patriotism is not required to understand what we're about to get into, but it will certainly help you to comprehend some of the finer points of our argument. Effectively, we believe that Oshima used the pre-existing character of Captain Yanoi to embody and critique the idealistic right-wing views of Yukio Mishima. A decade following Mishima's passing in 1970, Oshima was explaining through Merry Christmas Mr. Lawrence's fiction and historical perspective why he thought that something like Imperial Japan could not work. Captain Yanoi is perhaps the most important aspect of the film from a Japanese perspective, given that he embodies the values and hypocrisies of pre-war and wartime Japan as Oshima perceived them. In Yanoi, we see the Japanese supremacy in which the Imperial military fighting the Allied soldiers believed. We also see the veneration of the Emperor as a literal descendant of the gods that Mishima pushed to defend later in life. And perhaps more subtly, we see the open secret of Mishima's homosexuality, or at least bisexuality, embodied in the character of Yanoi. But why would Oshima have gone to such lengths to remove Mishima's name from Yanoi's character? Of course, we can surmise that Mishima was only 19 during the film's setting, and placing a real person into a fictional, albeit wholly realistic, setting like this would run the risk of defaming Mishima's character. What's more, Sakamoto's portrayal of Captain Yonoi is derived directly in both actions and character from the novel The Seed and the Sower by Laurens van der Post, a POW who lived through life in the Japanese camp. Most of the film, in fact, is lifted scene for scene from the novel, with Oshima adding pieces here and there. We'll get more into this later, though. It just so happened that Von der Post's version of Yonoi lined up pretty well with Mishima's character in life, making it an unnecessary move to change much in order to explore Mishima's beliefs through fiction. There are two other major points that show that Yonoi embodies all of these projected qualities without becoming Mishima in a literal sense. The first of these reasons was a pragmatic one, that being that Mishima's widow, Yoko, was not exactly comfortable with Mishima's legacy. As we discussed previously, Yoko successfully held patriotism from being circulated in Japan prior to her own death in 1995. What's more, several years after the release of Merry Christmas Mr. Lawrence, she had Paul Schrader's Mishima A Life in Four Chapters barred from being released in the country. The couple's children had the same mentality, with both of them bringing, and winning, a suit against Jiro Fukushima for a publication in Fukushima's memoir of letters between him and Mishima. Mishima's children claimed copyright infringement, which is officially what won the case, but it was arguably less about the fact that Fukushima published these letters, and more about the fact that these letters detailed a homosexual affair between the two men during the 1950s. As you can probably surmise, due to Mishima's estate's treatment of those who would perhaps call attention to his political legacy, or those who might have claimed him to be a homosexual, Oshima made the smart decision of making Yanoi embody Mishima without being Mishima. Need another example? Look to the vocal version of the film's theme song, a collaboration between Sakamoto and David Sylvian of the 80s band Japan. This version is known as Forbidden Colors, borrowing its name from the major novel by Mishima which dealt explicitly with being covertly homosexual. Honestly, this mention might seem out of place, but it's really just a great song and we couldn't go this whole video without mentioning it. The second, more personal reason for the inclusion of Mishima in Yonoi's character is the relationship between Mishima and director Nagisa Oshima. Prior to Mishima's heel turn in the late 1960s, where he became openly right-leaning and vocally nationalistic, he had formed strong bonds with a number of other prominent artists, among them highly regarded left-leaning directors like Oshima. It has been commented that, once Mishima took up his new politicism, and as his path diverged from that of those calling for revolution in a way other than his own, he maintained these friendships by simply not discussing politics with those he knew were opposed to his views. Mishima was a socialite who prided himself on his family's aristocratic lineage, 
and he knew how to play his cards to maintain a good public image. He understood how to be viewed as a provocateur and an eccentric artist, rather than an out-and-out -out radical. He was such a pillar of the Japanese artistic community before his death that both he and Oshima, who should have been his ideological opponent due to their conflicting political views, stood and gave a defense testimony at the obscenity trial of Tetsuji Takechi for his boundary-pushing film Black Snow in 1965. At this trial, Takechi was prosecuted for a scene involving nudity near a U.S. military base, something seen as a political statement due to the location. Despite their conflicting politics, both Oshima and Mishima argued in favor of artistic freedom. As a result, artists like Oshima were close enough to him to be horribly broken up following his suicide, with Oshima even producing a melancholic obituary which is reprinted in his essay collection, Cinema, Censorship, and the State. Oshima states in his essay that he hadn't met Mishima many times, but that, quote, Speaking for myself, I am amazed that something inside me could be so moved by this death, particularly a suicide. Is this reaction common to all Japanese? My political position is that I would like to try to make Mishima's death the last in a pattern of political deaths in Japan since the Meiji era. End quote. He goes on to describe two separate occasions in particular where they came together, one in which Mishima screened one of his films at his estate, and another where the two men were interviewed together in the later 60s. Despite not knowing each other incredibly well, Oshima clearly held an affection for Mishima, as he has some pretty strong opinions about the late author. Oshima explains that due to Mishima's lack of human sensibility, he couldn't have become a good politician, that he couldn't have convinced others to believe in or agree with him. Quote, Having conquered his physical deficiency, he moved on to conquer his political deficiency. Conquering his political deficiency, however, was not an easy thing, particularly for Mishima, given his lack of sensitivity to the left wing, either in terms of his constitution or his class. He discovered that in raising the issue of emperor, he could transcend himself. This, however, was an immense contradiction, because conquering one's faults one after another is not a Japanese way of living. It is easier for a Japanese to live exposing his or her faults. It is terribly tragic, therefore, that at the very end of his life, Mishima, who had lived a life that was in no way typical for a Japanese, particularly not for a Japanese literary figure, had to stake his life on the most Japanese phenomenon of all, the emperor. This was doomed to failure." End quote. With this quote in mind, we can see that Captain Yonoi is not just an avatar for Yukio Mishima, but an expression of why someone who held Mishima's sensibilities could thrive only in a climate like that of Japan during the war, especially in a POW camp. The mold created by Vanderpost's version of Captain Yonoi is perfect to fill with Mishima's character and to examine how someone who professed Mishima's views might have acted, though it's with some sadness that Oshima seems to make this connection. Quote, Thinking about the fact that Japan's official left wing has been consistently apathetic about death, particularly regarding its political significance, I have the presentiment that the political signal launched by Mishima will probably become a painful, heavy piece of baggage. It has become a painful, heavy piece of baggage for me, but through his death, I have felt very close to Mishima. If I were with the Mishima I feel I know today, I think I could go drinking with him." End quote. Thus, Yonoi is Mishima in a leadership role of the Imperial Army, and yet we see time and again that Yonoi is, in fact, not an effective leader. Hara, the camp's gunso, is the true leader here, which is true to form. The gunso of a given camp was effectively the drill sergeant, rather than the commanding officer. In spite of this lower position, the gunso would sometimes be known for driving prisoners harder than the captains and commanders in charge of camps. We observe this as early as the film's opening, where Hara and his peers awaken the prisoners early in the morning by entering the barracks and beating them. This was something that would actually happen, as all camps, regardless of time zone and location, were run on Tokyo time, meaning that many were forced to start operation hours before daybreak. We also see the Gunso's ruthlessness exemplified in Hara's treatment of Lawrence and the other prisoners, especially when disciplining them. We'll get more into this later, but in spite of communicating with Lawrence, Hara has no way to see him as an equal, even if he is fluent in Japanese. Before we examine this more, though, let's get into how the film relates to the books from which it is derived. 
Lorenz van der Post was an Afrikaner soldier, born and raised in South Africa, who fought under the flag of Britain during World War II. He was captured and imprisoned on the Pacific island of Java, where he remained for several years until the war's end. Afterward, he made a name for himself telling his story in both memoirs and fictional accounts. Following his death in 1996, his legacy has been met with a certain amount of criticism, with some claiming that his stories may have not been entirely truthful. While this is an important topic to note, we should also bear in mind that we are exploring a fictional work derived directly from a set of fictional novellas penned by Vanderpost, and collected as The Seed and the Sower, as well as indirectly from one of his memoirs, The Night of the New Moon. The characters of the film are lifted from the former of the books, as well as several sequences which are brought over wholesale. Namely, two of Lawrence's meetings with Hara, Sellier's romantic advances towards Yanoi, and the final scene of the film are left completely intact almost word for word, though it's notable that in the novella, Vanderpost actually carries the story further. The seed in the sower as a whole is told in past tense, as those who survived the camp together recounting tales of Hara, Yanoi, and Sellier's, while the film is told in present tense, meaning that the characters don't have the perfect vision of hindsight. What we mean to say is that several episodes, one prominent scene of which occurs after the end of the film, are left out of Oshima's adaptation, leaving the conclusion perhaps more ambiguous than the novella collection. Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, is not meant to be a historical record, but a dramatization of events and situations that Nagisa Oshima was concerned were being forgotten or simply not taught to the Japanese public. In fact, in Gavin Dawes' book, Prisoners of the Japanese, we learned that the same holds true in most combatant nations of the West. Following the war, the Japanese Ministry of Education was quick to undersell some of the events of the war, specifically the existence of POW camps in the Pacific and the numbers of prisoners held there. Of course, this is something that pretty much happens whenever a nation exits a war where atrocities have happened, or where it turned out that they were on the losing side. As for our American viewers, how much did you learn about Vietnam in high school? Have you ever heard of something called the Philippines War? The issue of POW erasure wasn't exclusive to Japan, though with Western belligerent nations more or less forgetting as well. The atrocities which occurred in Europe at the same time were seen to dwarf what happened to Western troops in the Pacific, not to mention the occurrences of incidents like the Battle of Stalingrad, a conflict that lasted more than six months and resulted in more than one million Soviet casualties, and nearly one million on the side of the Axis powers as well. With events like this and the Holocaust occurring in Europe, it might be easy to see how we would forget about what happened in the Pacific. Dawes describes, in the course of researching his book, finding countless files containing the testimonies of men who were released from the camps following the war. Files which had been documented, then simply shut away, not appearing except perhaps as footnotes or simple statistics in official accounts of the war. This wasn't just a few thousand troops, however. Dawes explains that when the Japanese invaded the Pacific Islands controlled by the Allies, two weeks had passed since the attack on Pearl Harbor. The Allied troops put up a fight for a time, before realizing that the Imperial Navy was blocking their supply routes. At this point, being held hostage and starved out, commanders began handing down the order for troops to surrender. In the end, those who capitulated were so numerous that the Japanese commanders decided to release all of the locals who had been captured by the Allies. This served the purpose of improving Japanese optics, where they sought to show Pacific Islanders that they were freeing them from their white colonizers, more or less. Realistically, they did this because they had simply too many prisoners, and they knew they couldn't care for all of them. Even after this mass release of natives, the Japanese remained in control of 140,000 captured troops. Roughly one-third of them would die of various reasons. Starvation, tropical disease, beatings, executions, and so on. While that number might be significantly lower than the numbers who died in the Holocaust and battles like that of Stalingrad, we're still talking about roughly 50,000 people. Of course, that is a whole lot of prisoners to feed and take care of. This surprise of taking charge of so many more men than expected was one of the two reasons that led directly to the extremely poor treatment of allied prisoners. Japan signed the Geneva Convention in 1929, but never ratified the portion of the Geneva Convention on humane treatment of POWs within their own country. 
the Japanese government the Japanese government never officially acknowledged this portion, meaning that as far as the Allies knew, the Japanese would adhere to the same rules of engagement and treatment for POWs as the other combatant nations, but that Japan had no legal need to adhere to these standards. As Dawes explains, quote, the way the Japanese read the 1929 Geneva Convention, an enemy prisoner of war in their hands would be entitled to a softer time than a Japanese fighting man in the field with the emperor's army. And to them, that was absurd. There was nothing in it for them. End quote. The Japanese foreign minister still told the world that even though they had not ratified the convention, they would act in accordance with its terms, except where it conflicted with existing Japanese policies. This leads into the other reason for the poor treatment of prisoners, that being ideological differences. Essentially, the Japanese government saw no reason to adhere to, nor even properly ratify, the Geneva Convention because of their warrior code passed down from that of the samurai. Bushido called for death prior to surrender. The Westerners, by contrast, saw honor in enduring to see the emperor's army defeated. This conflict is one we see directly portrayed in the film, like in the scene where one of the Westerners is heckled into attempting seppuku by the Japanese guards. Dawes puts the situation succinctly by saying, quote, Some Japanese officers demanded the killing of prisoners. Some encouraged it. Some tolerated it. A few opposed it. But even they endured it. No doubt any number of Japanese, officers and enlisted men, were just following orders, doing their job, whatever that might have meant to them in the service of the emperor, but nothing and nobody stopped the Japanese from doing whatever they felt like to their surrendered prisoners. Bushido, the way of the warrior, meant whatever officers wanted it to mean. Discipline likewise meant whatever they wanted it to. The result was mass atrocity." End quote. What's more, Lieutenant General Masaharu Homa, who was in charge of operations in the region, never punished a single soldier for mistreating prisoners. We also explore at points in Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, the lack of food offered to the prisoners, which was a common occurrence within the camps, given that guards would often raid or entirely confiscate aid delivered to POW camps. Anything the prisoners could find to eat became like gold. Reptiles, mammals, pythons, iguanas, herbs, bugs. Food was so scarce that anything and everything was valuable to the men. In fact, those situated in camps near local housing in the Pacific, or those forced to work on the Burma Siam Railroad, would trade what little money they had been able to hold onto or smuggle with them for small morsels. From these realities, we can extrapolate that the portion in which Selliers brings flowers to the men is not unreasonable, though it is significantly more melodramatic and glamorous than reality likely was. However, while this food shortage was a universal issue, it affected different classes of soldier differently. Supposedly, it got to a point as the war drew on that one could determine another's rank by how emaciated they were. We discussed earlier the Japanese imperial military's contempt for the allied troops who had surrendered rather than committing suicide. However, the harshness of this contempt depended on one's rank and the amount of money they maintained when they entered the camps. From the beginning, the Japanese would kill anyone below the rank of general as they wanted but the higher-ranking officers were considered more valuable. These officers and commanders, of course, being the same who had told the enlisted men to surrender in the first place. As you might imagine, the enlisted men did not take kindly to this, and held their own amount of contempt for their superiors. This led, in turn, to the officers buying off the guards in order to segregate themselves. One, so that they wouldn't have to deal with the men below them, and two, so that they didn't have to see the worst conditions that their men were living in. For the Americans, Australians, and those who hailed from the smaller allied nations, ranks broke down in the camps, with this segregation becoming the only true distinction. For the British officers, however, Dawes reports that they tried to the end to maintain their composure. Americans interviewed for his book would gawk at how these British men, so malnourished and exhausted as they were, would still be forced by their commanding officers to drill as they would during typical military life. This quality we see exemplified perfectly in Lawrence's superior and his strained relations with Lawrence and the others. Lawrence is of a lower rank, meaning that his superior believes he should acquiesce to his demands and show respect, while Lawrence and any other number of British soldiers 
look to him as pompous and trapped in his own head. This could partially be due to Lawrence being able to speak Japanese, quite a rare skill at the time, with Dawes estimating it to be possessed by only 1 in 5,000 captured. So we could argue that Lawrence doesn't take the hierarchy seriously because he knows he has more leverage speaking the language. It was not uncommon for guards, especially commanding officers, to know some English or to have even studied in the United States before being drafted, but to simply refuse to speak it out of a sense of pride. This too we see in Captain Yonoi, who can speak English fluently, but simply refuses to do so. The commanding officer for the British is the equal and opposite, too prideful to even entertain the notion of lowering himself to the level of the enemy, but perfectly happy to use Lawrence to translate. Thus, it's through Lawrence that we can explore both worlds effectively, which is precisely why we follow his story and his attempts to understand the enemy, no matter how he and his compatriots are treated. With respect to how the British acted compared with other Allied prisoners, Dawes has this to say, quote, I would go so far as to say that it was nationality above all that determined, for good or ill, the ways POWs lived and died, often whether they lived or died." End quote. Sellier's, meanwhile, is another story, and a truly tragic one. As Dawes reports, men were almost required to form groups in order to survive. Due to the environments in which they lived, the lack of medical care or proper equipment, and the rampant malnutrition in the camps, Dawes explains that if one fell ill, it was imperative to have several other men to pick up the slack and to look after the infirm. As Dawes puts it, quote, The only way to survive was to be the sharpest and the most cunning of all. Their doctrine boiled down to one line, the strong beat the weak, and the smart beat the strong. End quote. Loners like Selliers, meanwhile, were doomed to death in most cases. Here, as well as with the commanding officers forming a clique, some of the other enlisted men banding together, and Lawrence having the support of both sides as an interpreter, we see how the prisoners of the Japanese found different niches to fill in order to survive. On August 15, 1945, World War II officially drew to a close with the radio broadcast Declaration of Surrender from Emperor Hirohito. In this now infamous broadcast, the Emperor spoke directly to the commoners of Japan for the first time in recorded history. Over the following weeks, the tens of thousands of surviving POWs held in the Pacific were released and returned to their home nations. For many of them, this did not call for an early retirement, but simply a return to the posts they had held before the war. General Douglas MacArthur, the American commander in the Pacific theater of the war, struck a deal in which numerous Japanese scientists who had performed illegal and inhumane experiments on prisoners were given amnesty in exchange for scientific data. Meanwhile, the foot soldiers and commanders were put to trial over the coming years, with many being sentenced to death for war crimes of which they were found guilty. The world moved on, and America came to occupy Japan, with MacArthur taking charge as supreme commander of the Allied powers during the period of Reconstruction. Historians on both sides of the conflict took stock of everything that had occurred, placing importance on whichever portions they found more serious or grievous than others. And over time, for almost 50 years, official accounts of what had happened to the prisoners in the Pacific fell into obscurity. But it is vitally important, no matter how difficult these subjects may be to stomach, that we not forget the past. We should not judge present generations based on the sins of their fathers or their grandfathers, but we should also not turn a blind eye to these events, lest they be forgotten and repeated. This is why fictions like those of Lawrence Vanderpost, despite questions to the validity of his non-fictions, or films like Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, are staggeringly important works. This is why works like those of Gavin Dawes are a necessity, taking stock of past events, no matter how egregious and reprehensible they may be. Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence was an important film in the time that it was crafted, as it served to question the values upheld by the Empire of Japan and espoused by post-war figures like Yukio Mishima, while bringing to the attention of an international audience the stark reality of these horrid conditions. It's one of the best examples we've perhaps ever come across of being a true work of artistic fiction, using lies to tell the truth. It's perhaps Mishima's most easily accessible film, being that it's remarkably non-experimental given the rest of his filmography. But it is, at the same time, one of his most important, perhaps today more than ever, 
with a younger generation who has become so far removed from the horrors of World War II. We personally believe that it's important for us to re-examine events like these with the gravity and respect that they deserve, rather than co-opting them and devaluing them or simply ignoring them. As Dawes explains in the opening portions of his book, quote, What the Japanese people of the post-war decades, all the way to the 50th anniversary years of the war, were told about World War II in their own language was very little indeed. Typically, Japanese school and college textbooks gave only a half a dozen or so pages to the war in its entirety, phrased in sanitized language officially endorsed by the Ministry of Education. In the orthodox teaching of the Japanese national tribe, Japan was the victim of white aggression, and the atrocities of war began and ended with the atom bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki." End quote. Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence is not only a phenomenal film which brought us one of David Bowie's best film performances and which helped Takeshi Kitano transition into dramatic acting. It's a necessary film, and one of the best jumping off points for learning about these lessons from history that we might either ignore or about which we may be wholly unaware. 